So welcome uh, to our leadership seminar series again. Uh, today we've got a great speaker, Mr. Angel Ruiz, and we appreciate him being here. Uh, he is via video conference, but again, that's because we wanted his message. And we're going to try it, and as you start to think about how we're going to work in the future, it's international, it's global, it's different time zones. And he'll probably share with you, they've got 160 sites, and they have these teleconferences all over the place. I work with folks in San Francisco and Vancouver, and this is how we meet. So it's just, it's, it's how the world is moving, so it's a great thing to try it today. A couple things you ought to know about him. First, he is a UCF alumni, 1978, if I remember correct, a double E. Um, he's going to talk about leadership in a wired, in a wired, wireless world. I kind of, that's what we're doing today. Uh, he is the head of no, uh, North America Ericsson. He's worked at Singular, uh, Bell South, AT&T. He's worked in Mexico, Venezuela, Sweden. Very broad experience. And as we talked uh, earlier last week, at times he's impatient. And that's why he's had the career moves. And I think what you'll hear from him, it's impatience about making a difference, about bringing value, bringing solutions to the world. And to me, that's a good reason to be impatient, to want to go make a difference. Uh, so he'll share some of that story. He's well recognized, many awards, community awards, and it's about giving back. And you all read his bio. Uh, and then, so we're really privileged today to have you speak with us, Angel, and really share your story. And so, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Welcome. All right. So, uh, so thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, really, uh, it's great to be able to do this and do it this way. I, I, I hope. Uh, uh, that you can hear me and, and see me okay. Uh, um, you know, when, when we are able to do video like this, I mean, this is very much my world and the way that, uh, that we have to do business. Um, you know, two days ago, I was in this room at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, our headquarters is in Stockholm, Sweden. And, um, and so, you know, they're seven hours ahead of us. So while it was four o'clock in the morning here for us, it was, uh, if I did my math right, it was <laughs> 11 o'clock in the morning for them. And, um, and, and I do that, we do that all the time. So, uh, so I think, you know, being able to do this this way, in a way it gives you a little bit of a flavor of what you're headed into being, in, being engineering students and, and the kinds of technologies and the way that the world has evolved uh, because of all the, the, the technology progress and things that have happened. Um, you know, as far as the speaker series is concerned, I think what I said is, is uh, you, you may not, um, how do I say, you may not uh, realize it, but um, I think it will enable you to be able to get, uh, you know, better speakers, perhaps people that, you know, like me that, you know, is on a plane. Uh, I mean, I basically live on a plane. I go to Europe 18 times a year. And, um, and so you can imagine how much the amount of time that's doing something like this saves me. I'll, I'll, I'll say this, if, uh, if this doesn't work well, then uh, I'll be more than happy to come, come down and, and, and do this in person so that, uh, so that the guys there get a, do, do get a good experience. So uh, I, I, hope that, uh, I hope that it works well. It will work well, but we will also invite you down. All right. So you can still, you can still hear me and see me okay? Yes. We're good. All right. All right. So... You know, my name is Angel Ruiz. I'm president of Ericsson's uh, North American company. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll walk through and I'll tell you a little bit, of, a, a bit, of, a little bit about myself, uh, a little bit about Ericsson and, uh, and the industry that we work in, um, and then, uh, and then uh, some of the challenges that I've faced, uh, you know, sort of how my career evolved and how I got here. Uh, perhaps, you know, what I'll try to do is I'll try to remember and say things that you'll be able to use, um, and if you, you know, if you remember, uh, and try to say things that you'll remember uh, as you evolve and develop in your career and things that will help you, uh, whether you're interviewing or you're in your first job or, you know, you're tired of doing what you're doing, you want to make a change. Uh, those, are, those are the kinds of things that I went through um, as my, you know, my career evolved, uh, especially in the, in the, in the earlier years. So I, you know, I, um, I came from Cuba 
uh, when I was 12, uh, back in 1968, and um, my parents went right to Baltimore, Maryland, because that's where we had an aunt there, and that, that's where our support structure was, so that's where we went. Um, I went through, you know, middle school and high school, and in my first couple of years of college, actually the first two years of college in, in Baltimore, and then I did, I finished my uh, electrical engineering degree at, uh, was then FTU, uh, 1976 to 1978, so that, that, that dates me a little bit, so you can imagine, you know, how long ago that was. I think the campus, you know, I, I've been to the campus. My, my parents live right on uh, University Boulevard, and I, and I go there twice a year, every year. They've been there since the early 80s. Uh, my brother lives there. My, my wife's parents live in Orlando, so we have a lot of ties back to Orlando, so we, we come there all the time. And, and I've had uh, a number of uh, nieces and nephews that have gone, through, have gone to UCF. So I come to campus. I haven't been in campus um, in a couple of years, um, but I am familiar a little bit with the campus now. And, you know, when I went uh, at graduation time, people used to go in the fountain. I don't know if you still do that, if you still have that kind of uh, tradition or not. Um, but it was a very, very, very small graduating classes. And I think at the time there were about 8,000 students in the school. So that, that, <laughs> that gives you an idea of what it was like back then. We probably graduate 8,000 students a year or a semester, right? So it's, it's grown a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I graduated in, uh, in 78, and then um, I had a couple of jobs uh, for, sort of say, you know, they were like one-year jobs until in 1980 I started in telecommunications with a company up, up in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, before the Bell system broke up. And then I went to Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University, and got a master's uh, in information systems and, and, and management science. And I finished that in 1983, and by then I had gotten started in telecommunications. The first uh, 10 years of my life or so, <clears throat> the first 10 years of my career or so, I, I, you know, I bounced around quite a bit. I, I was always very impatient in my jobs. Um, you know, once I spent a year, a year and a half in a position, I, I, you know, for me, I always looked up and I saw the people that I reported to and I always felt like, well, hell, I can do that job better than they can, so I'm, you know, you know, why, why am I stuck here? So I would, I would move around. So if you looked at my, my career path, I was, during the first 10, uh, 15 years of my job, almost really until I started this job, which I've been in for 11 years now, I, every year and a half or so, I've moved. And it's always been for a good reason. It was never because I wasn't doing a good job or I got fired or laid off. It was always because I, you know, I was, I was trying to make my, my, my way forward and I was ambitious and I, I wanted to get ahead. So back in, in 19, uh, 1990, I started with Ericsson um, and I've been with Ericsson ever since. Um, so I've been, uh, you know, I, when I look back now, because I, I used to say all the time, you know, I, I, I never stayed with one company for a long time. And, uh, and there were a number of reasons for that, but, you know, fortunate, I was fortunate enough to find a home at Ericsson and, and make Ericsson uh, my home. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Ericsson's a, a great company, very, very, very good ethics. Um, you know, before coming to Ericsson, I had jobs as a, as a product manager or salesperson and I would have to make presentations to the customers and the customers would say, Angel, you know, we can tell you're, you're, you're lying about what you're saying because you're starting to perspire, you're starting to sweat. And, uh, you know, in all the times, all the years that I've been with Ericsson, and typically that happens in smaller companies where you, sometimes you have to, yeah, when you're selling, you have to stretch the truth a little bit about when a product's going to be available and things like that and it puts you in an awkward position. But I, you know, in the 20 years or so that I've been with Ericsson, fortunately enough for, for me and... Uh, and the way this company works, Ericsson has never really put me in, in a position like that. And so, you know, I made a, I made a home out of Ericsson and I've been here for, you know, 20 plus years now. So Angel, so, so to, just on that real quick. So when you were in those spots where you maybe had to stretch the truth just a little bit, um, and these folks are going to be starting work in a year or two, what do they do when they're put in that, in that position, right? Do they stretch the truth? Do they tell the truth? Do they walk away? And, and well, you, you know, and so I, um, you know, for me personally, and it depends on, you know, it depends on your personality and the way that, that you go about doing things. But for me personally, as I said, you know, I have to start to perspire. It was hard to, 
it was hard to say, you know, this, uh, this product is going to be available, you know, first quarter next year instead of, you know, what I really knew, which was it wasn't going to be, be available until first quarter of the following year. And, and you know, uh, interestingly enough, Ericsson, um, for many years, uh, the earlier years of Ericsson, and a, and a lot of it comes because of the culture that Ericsson has um, being a Swedish company, you know, the Swedes tend to be uh, dry and, and uh, be very, very conservative. Um, and so they would tend to tell the truth. And what would happen, um, you know, to Ericsson uh, in many, many cases, and I've been in many of those cases, is that the company would then be, be disadvantaged because American companies are much more aggressive and, and they tend to stretch the truth, you know. And, and you know, when you, do, when you do business with between big companies, if you stretch the truth a little bit, you get away with it because once the two companies start to work together, the engagements are so big that it's very painful for them to break apart. So the, the customer will live with a little bit of delays. You know, if, it, if a product gets delayed a quarter or two quarters, the customer will put up with that and, and live with it because it's just too painful to unravel, you know, a multi billion dollar contract in, in many cases so so but it, it you know so it was part of part of a, a great learning for me and uh like i said eventually it was what made me settle down and and, and stay at eric's and I, you know in, in fairness it was that plus the success that i've had in in uh in, in growing and, and making my way to, to the position that i have that i have Let today me, can i talk on just a little bit of that stretching the truth a little bit with you. So I get with the companies, but now you have some direct reports that report to you, right? And so these folks are going to have a boss. When your direct reports come to you, do you want them to stretch the truth or be dead on with you? And if they start to stretch the truth, how do you lead them back to telling you the whole truth? You know, I, you know, I, and, and, and culturally, um, you know, this is something that you, you have to be very careful with. I mean, we, you know, as a company, our ethics are, you know, really uh, foremost, you know, up front and center. The, the thing that we preserve and, and, and talk about the most, um, you know, we're a big company. We are in 180 countries around the world. We do, you know, we do business in just about every country. The, the only countries where we do not do business in are countries that, are current, that currently have embargoes political embargoes. We, we tend to stay away from, from those countries, to, you know, for obvious political reasons. But, uh, you know, when you do business in, um, in a multi-country environment like that, with many, many, many different cultures, you know, and in, 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 you know, in, some, in one culture, what could be considered a bribe is, it, you, know, it's a, you know, something could be a gift. And, you know, for Ericsson people um, to to work throughout all these different environments and the company be able to be able to 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 succeed and and uh, and do well and prosper, we, we do have to deal with the kind the kind of thing that you that you asked about. Um, you know, when you when you get down to it, you you, you know that you, you say to the salesperson, you know, of course the salesperson you never want to lose a deal. So when the salesperson is engaging with a customer, the rule number one is the salesperson should not lose a deal. And, and it kind of works backwards that way into the or, into the Ericsson organization and all the way up to me, in many cases, you know. And I and, and, and at each step of the management level, you say to the lower level management, you shouldn't lose a deal. The manager should lose a deal. And so, it's, and um, it, depending on the, you know, and that doesn't happen every day, and it doesn't happen with every engagement. I mean, we do, you know, on an annual basis, Ericsson Ericsson North America does about nine billion dollars of business. So you can imagine how how many you know, hundred thousand dollar engagements, ten thousand dollar engagements we do when when the customer is negotiating something, you know, an additional piece of software or an additional additional piece of hardware with us. But but you know, you you establish as a culture that you want to be aggressive in selling, but you do never want to compromise your ethics, and that's and that's the most important part. And anything in between those two, is fair game. Because in the end, what matters then is results and winning the business. Yeah. And I think that's 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 a bit of the secret to success, to the kind of success that we've had. If you if you put those two things together, so let me. So if I if I could, yep. I'm trying to be mindful of the time.
If I could, I just want to finish. So, you know, Ericsson, we, we do business in about 180 countries um, because this will relate and help, you know, help you understand a little bit better later when you ask me questions about how I operate and how we do things and why we do things the way we do. Um, very, very international company. Um, our business is telecommunications. If you follow specifically the wireless piece of telecom, I mean, you I don't know how much of an idea or how much if you did any research before uh, before you came today, um, but you you know what's happened in wireless. If each of you, if I asked you how many of you have a, an iPhone, probably most of you would raise your hand and say you have you, you have an iPhone or you have a uh, a Samsung, one of the Samsung Galaxy, Galaxy models, um, because because of the the, you know, the evolution in wireless and what's happened to to all the devices and you know how you know you're able to communicate on the move all the time. So um, 180 countries, very progressive and very dynamic, very competitive industry, hyper competitive. If you look at the track record of of my my competitors, Ericsson. Uh, so Ericsson has, um, right today, there's a company called Nokia Siemens, which used to be two, two companies. It used to be Nokia and Siemens separately. And Nokia, you probably, some of you know, because Nokia makes, also makes handsets. Uh, there's also another company called Alcatel Lucent, which also used to be two companies. They, they merged, just like, just like Nokia Siemens did and became NSN. There used to be a company called Nortel, a Canadian company, which used to be a huge telecommunications company, you know, their market capital uh, worth was in the, in the billions, 30, 40, 50 billion dollars. At one time over 200 billion dollars. They're no longer with us. They went bankrupt uh, three, four years ago. There's one more big competitor globally, which is called Huawei, a Chinese company that's become very, very, uh, you, probably our number one competitor today. And, you know, if you guys want to, we can talk about that a bit uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a minute or in a little while. But in, in, in telling you about how competitive the environment is, um, it sets the stage for how you have to uh, run and manage uh, the business that we have. I mean, for the most part, our environment is one where, you know, you, you have to maintain a certain uh, amount of market share because you need the scale in the business in order for you to, to do well and be profitable. Um, but you're doing that while at the same time, our customers, which are the, the providers to your, your wireless service, AT&T, Verizon, MetroPCS, Sprint, T-Mobile, all those guys are our customers now in North America and, uh, and around the world. Company, big companies like Vodafone, Telefonica, those are global companies that also do the, basically the same kind of thing that AT&T and Verizon do today. You know, for those for those companies, it is, it is also hyper competitive. If you think about Orlando, for example, I think in Orlando, basically all those companies that I just mentioned, they all they are all buying for your business. They are all trying to make you their customers. You know, they they lure you in and they say, if you take our service, you know, we will give you an iPhone or we will give you a. You know, they're basically subsidizing the device in order to get your subscription or you know. It used to be a contract. Some of them now don't offer a contract as part of the, the competitive offer. So, Angel, so in this hyper-competitive world you exist in, you guys are going to go hire these engineers and computer scientists behind me. What do they need to bring to the table for you to go be successful? Right? So. Okay. So I, I guess right? I'm talking too much about the company. You want me to talk about something else? Yeah, so, so the, we talked. He gave me permission to help facilitate them. I'm doing it very softly. <laughs> no, I'm but, fine. You know, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm good with it. Yeah. I, and, and basically, I, you know, and that's the point I wanted to make because, and then when we start to talk about leadership, um, yes. and we start talking about you know what the students need to do in order to to make their way through you know their first uh, couple of jobs, then this will be per you know that's why that's yes. why I oh, handle yeah, this yeah. subject. So. So, 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 sorry. So, what was your question again? So, so, so I mean, and this is great background because some, some of the folks that they've talked to or speakers come here, their industry isn't as competitive as yours. And so they expect kind of different behaviors. And then so as, as you start to share your story, hey, folks, it's this everyday industry where we got phones in front of us and it's hyper competitive. And that means as an engineer, computer scientist, I probably got to behave differently than if I work for a government agency or a government contractor or something. 
right? And so as you start to think about the folks you're trying to bring in, what do you expect from them? Because in order absolutely. for you to be and, successful. And, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, and I, you know, when I, and I do, uh, I do lots of, lots of interviewing and, you know, we could talk a little bit about that when we talk yes. about my, my leadership or management style. But, um, you know, if you, if you come to work for an Ericsson or a Nokia Siemens or an Alcatel Lucent or a Huawei, one of these big telecom telecommunication suppliers, or even the providers like an AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, Verizon, it's, you know, and, and it and is a very dynamic industry and we've been very, very fortunate because the industry has had tremendous, tremendous growth. But it, but I, you know, when I interview people and I talk to, to folks like you, we have, you know, big programs where we bring in lots of students, graduating students with, with uh, double E's and uh, computer science degrees and MBAs, you know, and I tell them right up front, I mean, our, our industry and our environment is not for everybody. And, and, it, and there is significant, significant difference between when you talk about the way that a uh, you know, someone that perhaps goes into the food industry or goes into the pharmaceutical industry or goes into the government business, how that would be, you know, versus, uh, you know, someone in the telecommunications environment. And I, and I think that's something for you guys to remember when you, when you start to look at your options for where you want to work, you should do some research and arm yourself with that information because, you, you, you know, you don't want, you don't want to, to take a job and then be miserable because you're having you're working in an, in an environment where, for example, in our in our business, you know, the company we do annual. It's very performance based. Everyone in the company is 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 ranked. You know, employees are ranked. I mean, we you, you perform. If you don't perform, we you know we if you read it, you know some of you when you graduate and if you move into management, you'll read about Jack Welsh. Uh, Another guy named Jim Collins, and these are these are guys that are, um, you know, renowned names in management, management science and leadership, and how they how they profess or they, they say management should be should be done. And they talk about how companies grow, and how companies are able to sustain a, a level of profitability in the market that you know provides. In the end, any company, any public company, has to provide shareholder value and a certain amount of growth and a certain amount of profitability. If you're not able to do that, either, you know, two th one of two things happen. The company goes bankrupt, somebody takes them over, or somebody acquires them, or they disappear, or the worst thing, <laughs> the management is changed. Which that, would, that would be the worst thing for, for me. So, so that would so, be a bad day for so, you. So, 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 if you went to work in a government environment, and I have, I have friends and, and, and relatives that work in a government environment, the, the big difference is this, you know, we, we have a, we'll have an engagement, you know, a new technology, like if some of you have heard about a, a technology called LTE, which is the technology that facilitates everything that your phones do and everything that your iPad does. Uh, this technology was rolled here and, and has been being rolled out here in North America the last four years. So these, and these technologies, every time one of these technologies comes, comes through, and there's technology cycles that come through all the time as, as you know, advancements are made to, for you to be able to do, you know, have more data come through your phone, video, you know, more and more technological advances, these contracts are worth hundreds of billions of dollars. And for very relatively short periods of time, six months to 18 months, these big companies go into these big contract negotiations with, and, and you know, the people that are in those contract negotiations are adrenaline junkies. You know, they, they, don't sleep, they don't eat, they don't drink, although the right kind of drinking, they may be doing the wrong kind of drinking for, you know, because the, the, the work drives them to drink. But they, they are, you know, they are literally adrenaline junkies. They are, they're, they're just high on winning the contracts and winning the business. And our industry is very much like that. And the, 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 the cycle from busting your butt and, and getting to a reward scenario is relatively short. And for a lot of our people, once they get used to working in that environment, they can't get off of it. They love it. Because, in, you know, in, in a very short period, a relatively short period of time, months, you're, you're working with people in the on the customer side. It's Ericsson and AT&T sitting down. 
and talking about the contract and how we're going to win and we need to win it. And, and, you know, it's just very, you know, very aggressive selling and, and negotiations. And then you win. And then if you, and if, if you win. But when you win, you win a huge contract, you make a name for yourself, you, I mean, after a few of those, you start to, the company starts to build a certain amount of credibility, and you as an individual build a certain amount of credibility that, you know, for me and, and for those of us who work in this industry, is second to none. That doesn't mean that you can't go into another industry, for example, on the, on the government side, where contracts then take, you know, you win a contract and then it takes 10 years or 20 years for a contract to, to evolve yeah. and, 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 and sometimes be decided upon. And that's okay. I mean, there are people, and you know, the people are working just as hard, people become just as successful. My, 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 I guess my whole point to your question is, is that what you guys need to do is make sure you research the company that you're going to interview with and that that company's environment suits your personality and your personal goals and what you want to achieve, you know, whether it's a, in, you know, in the, in the next 12 months or in the next three years or in the next five years. But that's very important because then when you do get into that environment, you are hired and you are able to, you know, you, you, you want to do well, you're going to be in an environment where you're happy there. And that then becomes really the most important part of the, of the, of the, the employer employee relationship. You know, and, Part of this, you said you interview a lot of folks, and another key of their word you said was credibility. So as, as you've interviewed your direct reports and their direct reports, and I imagine you walk away and you say, hey, some of these folks are really credible and some of these folks aren't so credible. What do you look for? What are the characteristics that the really credible folks have? So, so you know, when you when you um, when you come to an interview, I think it's uh, it's interesting because typically, especially if you come like like you guys, and I remember, you know, my first few interviews, um, you know, it's intimidating. It's uh, it's not easy. Uh, you go into a big company like Ericsson, and you know, HR uh, receives you, or HR may be on campus doing interviews, and you get a. You know, you may get 15 minutes, you may get 30 minutes of a person's time, and in that time frame, you need to make an impression. Uh, you need to, you know, you need, you need, to, you need to make them feel like you're the right person for the job, and and all those things, uh, all those things, all those things come into play. Interestingly enough, I think when we interview the sort of the right people for the job or the right kinds of people, um, you know, what we find is that the interview is almost a two-way interview, or should be a two-way interview. And, and that's something that's really hard for you guys to probably uh, think or, or envision right now that you could actually go into an interview and you would ask as many questions of the interviewer as they are asking of you. But you should really do that. And if you have, and here, here's the interesting part, I think. If you have the right interviewer in the right company, someone that you would want to work for, they will actually allow you the time to do that. And they will actually engage with you. If you happen to run into someone who you're interviewing with and they want to make it a one-way interview and it's just them asking questions and you're not able to position yourself and you're not able to ask them what they are like, what the company is like and what their culture is like and what their environment is like, perhaps that's somebody you don't want to go work for. So when you interview, it's very important that it's a two-way interview. It's not a one-way interview. And at, at, at first, that may be difficult for you guys to establish, but as you grow, because you don't think about it now, but you're going to interview hundreds of times, probably, you know, in the next X number of yeah. years, even within the same company. You know, as you, as you, you know, once you've been in a position for two or three years and you're looking to do something else, you have to go and interview with, you know, new bosses and new, new people, you know, new different departments, and that that becomes a very important part of your career path. How well you're able to do that, because in the end, again, you know you are most productive and most efficient and most effective when you're happy, when you feel good about what you do, when you feel good about who you work for, when you feel good about the people that you're working with. So you don't, you don't, you know, you, you, you want the interview to be a mutually beneficial, uh, have a mutually beneficial outcome. And so given that you want to make it two ways, interview, is there one or two questions they shouldn't ask? And so I've gone with students to interviews because I knew the, the person hiring, right, as an introduction. 
and kind of sat through there and she asked a question, well, how many hours a week am I going to work? And I knew she had the job up until that question and I could see the, the woman's face unhire her right there, right? And it was just that environment. And I think, yeah, and, and again, and the, the, again, the rationale for it being two-way and why it's important is because if, if you have to find out why the person's asking the question, if you have the right interviewer, the yeah. person should ask, you know, why are you asking how many hours you, you want to work? Or in our case, many people ask, you know, how much travel is involved in this position? And that's a perfectly, you know, good, perfectly logical um, question. And there's nothing wrong with that. So, so what you want to do in the end, when you interview, you want to find a fit, what I call the fit. That becomes the most important piece of the interview. It's a fit for the company and it's a fit for you. When there's a good fit, it makes for a good outcome. When there's not a good fit, it does not make for a good outcome. It's, you know, it sounds simple, but it really is that simple. And so during the interview, the questions that you ask should be geared towards you making sure that it's going to be a good fit. And, and, and again, I think a lot of it boils back to you know, how, how you research. Make sure you research the company or the department, and if possible, that even the people that you're going to interview with, and know, you know, have an idea, like you said, of what you know what you should ask and, and what you shouldn't ask. If you know that the job, if you know going into the interview that the job is going to require a lot of travel, I mean, don't go to the interview if you if you have a travel restriction. You know, I mean that that, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to be a good fit or a good outcome. So, is, so going back to your earlier part of your career where you switched jobs very often, was it fundamentally just because you didn't fit or it was because, hey, there's opportunity, I want to grow? Or maybe a little bit of both? I, 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 would, always, I would always look at the people that I was working for and I, I always used to feel like I could do the job better than they can. Yeah, okay. <laughs> hey, so I'll ask one last question and I'll open it up to the students. And given you graduated a while back, and you've had a long career and, and a lot of experience. If you had to do it all over again, is there one or two things you wish you would have done different? And said, you know, um, hey. Uh, yeah, I mean, probably, probably have been, been more patient. Um, because, you know, patience, in the end, impatience, I think, is what makes you succeed because it pushes you. But it also takes a lot out of you and it takes, it takes out of the family and it takes out of a lot of things that that you also need to, you know, to stay healthy and do well and and, uh, and have a good life and a good career. So, um, and for some people it's very difficult. For some people it's, you know, it becomes, a, you know, really tough to to have that patience, you know, to, you want to get something done and, and but you're interfacing with, you know, you need 10 other people to do what they're supposed to do before you can get your piece done. You know, that tends to happen, you know, in big company environments quite a bit. And, that, and that, that's, that's a big part of the jobs, too. I mean, you guys, um, how big the company is or how small the company is has a lot to do with the kind of environment that you're going to be working in. And th so, those again, those are the kinds of things that I think you, you want to research and uh, you want to make sure you have a good understanding about. So have you figured out how to be patient or are you still searching? And while I'm asking, if you figured it out, tell me, please, right? <laughs> No, no, I'm very, I'm still very impatient and, you know, that's what my, at least that's what my wife says. Right. Good. So I'll open up to students and then just so he can hear you, it's probably just e easier if you just walk up. We're going to start there's the line there's, right there's back a, here. There's someone brave. I was, I was, I was waiting for that. I, I thought this was going to be. <laughs> well, actually, sir, my question is, is, what would, what would you say is your biggest moment of impatience, or your biggest impatience, and how'd you deal with it? I mean, in terms of yeah, you know, what I, job. I, uh, so, you know, I, I uh, at one, one uh, long time ago, uh, in fact, some of these things are, really have made a difference in my career. Um, I, went to, I went to Sweden to work on a, on a contract, and I was there for two weeks, and uh, it was a very controversial contract, and, and uh, you know I spent two weeks working day and night, literally, in Sweden, in Stockholm, to, to get this, this contract done. And I was 
as you can imagine how ago this was, I was on my way back, and you know how I was bringing back the contract? It was a set of 11 binders in two, two suitcases <laughs> that I had with me. I get to the airport, and I have a message at the, uh, at the American Airlines counter waiting for me to call the person that I have been working with. And, they, and, the, and the, um, the message was is that I could not take the contract with me. Because the, the people that one part of the company did not want the contract to go to the customer that I was going to deliver it to. What do you think I did? You which, gave him the button smart, Which wasn't smart. I got on the plane with the contract. So, so little, literally, when I got off the plane in Dallas, I had security waiting for me, for me at the terminal to take the contract for me. And, uh, and the guys that uh, ran uh, Ericsson in the U.S. were waiting for me at the airport. Um, so I, uh, and in the end, you know, in the end, we, the contract got modified somewhat, but I did get to deliver the contract anyways, and, and, uh, and all was good. But, you know, I probably... Maybe missed the flight, going back, and not done what I did, and, and, and uh, listened to the person that was talking to me on the phone asking me to please not get on the plane. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, sir. All right, you're welcome. Other questions? They might be a little shy. We're cramped in here a little bit. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's hard. It's, it's awkward that they have, you know, next time what you should do is have a mic. I can go around the room, yes. so they don't have to come up to the podium. It's quite tough to stand up and go to the podium. Yeah, we're, we're trying to teach them how to be proactive, too, though. So, hey, but as we talked last week, you talked a little bit about the value and the worth of an engineering degree. And, and, um, and, you, and you seem to just share a lot of passion and energy about having that degree. Uh, so we have another woman come up to ask you a question, but do you want to share a little bit about your view on the value of the engineering degree? I mean, I, you know, I, I think that, uh, and, and, I, and, I, if, and if I could give you some advice, I think, I think it, I think you, again, you need to, once you graduate, because it's, you know, life and life you make steps, and, and when you look at, if you look at the life, if you look at life ahead of you now, you know, four years in, in an engineering degree, that's a long time. You're probably anxious to get out and start working, make some money, buy a car. You know, get 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 on with things, and and uh, and that's okay. And I think that that's probably the first the first valuable piece of having a, a degree in engineering, especially in an era where technology is is playing such a big part of our you know our, our daily lives. I mean, whether it's uh, telecommunications or you know many many of the other industries, in, in, you know, engineering is still you know. I mean, we have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of engineers. At Ericsson, uh, here in Ericsson, North America, we probably have five, six thousand, and probably you know out of, out of the seventeen thousand employees in North America, there's probably over ten thousand engineers. I mean, the bulk of our um, workforce is engineering, the engineering discipline, and and that becomes the foundation. I mean, Ericsson is an engineering company first and for, foremost, technology company, engineering company. In fact, we've. The challenge that we've had is that we've had to adapt to become more of a marketing company and things outside of engineering because we spend 15 to 20 percent of our overall annual sales on R&D, and so we're you know very very engineering driven. Engineering is you know the core of the the industry that that we work in and, and many many industries. So right off the bat, I think it gives you a platform for you to uh, launch from, and you know for some of you. The bachelor's degree will be enough, and you'll you'll stay as an engineer, and you'll work happily, you know, until you retire as an engineer. And because many companies like us, you know, we have an engineer level one, all the way through an engineer level five, and then from engineer you can go into either systems engineer, you can go into product management, which most of those people uh, have also engineering backgrounds, and then there's two or three levels of product management, and then from that you can go to yet another level of expertise which is somewhat of an expert level and, and basically all these jobs are non people reporting jobs or they're not management jobs they're what we call individual contributor jobs so that that kind of decision you will have some time along your career path where you will have to decide especially especially those of you who like to work with people you know typically you know we find that 
people come out of the engineering discipline, a lot of people don't want to have don't want to have to deal with people headaches. So they don't want to have to get go into management. So they stay in they stay in engineering. But uh, many people move over and start to manage people, and the minute you do that, then you become more of a you know you start to become more of a business person, and you you probably lose your engineering edge to some to some degree, and in, in, the, in those cases, then you know we send people to to advance uh, education to get MBAs or get degrees in management science or or uh, you know advanced degrees. So that's that's kind of a that's something that might happen to most of you, and a decision that you'll have to make: Do I stay in engineering and and um, is that okay, or do I go into, you know, other disciplines and then go after other degrees and things like that? Okay, thank you. Uh, um, and we'll get one more question. Okay. How close do I have to uh, be? You're good. Okay. Um, I've always been told that when you go to work for a company, they're really looking to put in, put, look at you as a long-term investment. And a large part of your story has been that you've been to many different companies to work for them. How long did it take for you to turn your multitude of experience into a strength rather than something that maybe people would look at with skepticism? Yeah, and, and you're and you're very right about that. You know, when you when you do what I did the first uh, ten years or so, um, and people look at your resume, they do because I do that as well as an interviewer. You know, you say, you know, it looks like you don't stay in one place very long. Why is that? So you better have a very good explanation as to why that is. I, I, I think I think the answer is, you know, in the end you have to do what makes you happy. And and uh, you know if you if 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 being happy means that you interview and you know and you stay in your job five years at a time and after twenty years you've been in four jobs, then then you won't have you, you know you won't have to worry about that problem and you'll be you'll have that kind of success. But there are people that do move around and they do it, you know, based on the success that they're having in each of the positions that they're in. And it also depends on the companies. I mean, some companies, it's, like in our company, it's very normal for a person to be in the job two and a half to three years. And after that, they, they move. And sometimes they move locally and sometimes they move internationally because of our geography. So, so it, you know, I mean, I think the answer to your question is more about you personally and, again, making sure that you explain and have good rationale for why and because sometimes sometimes the opposite is true if you if you came to interview with me and you've been in two jobs for 20 years I, I would look at you and say you know is that and the job that you're coming into is a job that requires a lot of energy and passion and drive and you have to be quick I would say are you that kind of person or are you more of a stable person that likes the stability of a position for a long, long time because that's not what this job is. So I think that's the way you have to look at um, look, look at what you're you know the question that you're asking me because it it kind of depends on you and it depends on on the company that you that you work for or, or you're interviewing for. And there can be success in either. Thank you so much. So I have one more question that got handed to me, and it has to do with non or non technical skills and attributes. You know, anyway, I, I, you know, I have I have a little more time if you so don't. Yeah. Okay, so what we kind of so some of the students have to leave because they have class, and so one of the things we teach them is you go to meetings on time, and so what we'll do then is we'll get this last question. I'll kind of wrap up, and then if folks want to stick around and interact, we'll do that because I I sort of every once in a while I like to protect the next professor's time, maybe. Uh, so, so we'll do it that way, but are there two skills, attributes, non-technically, that have served you well, right? So throughout your career, solid engineer, but there's two things you put on top of it that got you to where you are today. What would those two skills be, or attributes? The commun communications is very important. You know, you, you, I know it's hard. It's hard to stand up in front of people and, and talk. Uh, very, very difficult for some of us. It was extremely difficult for me. I came to the U.S. English was not my first language. I used to get made fun of, and you know, in school, when I, when I, when I <laughs> excuse me, when I would stand up and do, uh, you know, a speech class and so on. But communications is 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 paramount. If you are not a good communicator, you're going to struggle. And, and communication is not something. It's not a gift. It's something that you learn. It can be taught, and it's just something that you have to work at. 
So, you know, work at communicating. Communicating is probably the, the most important thing that you can become good at. Because it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, how effective you are and how efficient you are in many, many cases becomes a factor of how well you communicate. If you communicate well, then you're going you're gonna to do well. You know, when, when, you, when you don't communicate well, it's really hard for people to work with you. And in most companies, you know, you're going to have to work with other people. And so push yourself to, to, uh, to communicate. Um, you know, I, I think outside of that, there's other, other things that are intangible in terms of, you know, each of, each, each of our personalities that you have to learn to manage. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of an intangible, but I would say, it, you know, it's having the presence of mind to, to sort of question yourself and ask, you know, it, when, when you're confronted with circumstances, you know, how you manage your, I guess you could call it emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. You know, there's such, there, there are such tests. And it's something that you can do as you uh, as you uh, mature in, in companies. Some companies, you know, give you the the sort of the service for free. I think you can go on the on the web, and there are websites where you can do it for free. It doesn't cost any money, and it and it's an intangible, but it's a it's a pretty cool tool, and it really says a lot about. It will, it will tell you a lot about yourself, and and uh, because at the end, again, anybody who you go work for, what's going to matter to them is the results. And how you generate results, and how good you are at generating results. So you have to be efficient and effective to do that. To be effective, you have to communicate well, and then you have to make good decisions and and you know be someone that other people can rely on. And so you being rational, staying cool, calm, and collected, not losing your cool, um, you know, not climbing down, and you don't say you know you got. Like I said, you get pissed off in a meeting and you don't say anything else. You just shut down and, and you're done. You know, that, that, that doesn't help. Make sure that you, so learn how to control your emotions and, and have good, very, very solid emotional intelligence. That, that, that's very, typically very diff difficult for people. Yeah. So, Angel, I want to thank you. I was listening and taking notes. And I just summarized back at least what I learned, right? And so we are, we got to deliver results. We deliver results. We're most productive when we're happy. We're probably happy when we have a fit, right? And I fit with you and you fit with me in the, in the organization. Some of the things that are important as a part of that fit is are the ethics. And what's the culture of the company? And so I've got to research and understand what that company's about. In order to do that, I need to make that interview two ways, right? I've got to bring some questions and really probe them and if they're not willing to listen to me and my questions, maybe I don't want to work there, right? You said, hey, let's build credibility. Let's be patient. Let's stay healthy. Engineering is a great platform for the rest of your life. A couple things to take with you is communicate is important. Having emotional intelligence, balancing your emotions is important. And I think one of the biggest things I hear you say throughout that is you need to own your story. You need to build your story, own it, live it, and be able to share that and communicate that. So a lot of these lessons learned, I'm going to go back and, as I drive home today, think about. And I'll work on the patience a little bit, and maybe we can sh swap stories or lessons learned on how to do that. My colleagues behind me aren't saying a word, which is very not kind of them today. Um, thank you very much for sharing today. Uh, we appreciate it, and I think it worked well. Thank you. What we'll do, if you have to go to class, go to class. Don't be late. If you want to interact, we'll just interact back up here at the microphone. Um, hopefully it worked well for you, Angel. I mean, I think it worked pretty well here. So. It did. I, I mean, I, I hope it did so that you can, uh, you can uh, repeat the, uh, the experience. Yeah, and, and I like that idea. Maybe we'll ha work the mic so we could walk around with it. That's a good yeah, idea. That makes sense. Because we, you know, you know, we we do the same thing, and it, it makes a big difference. You don't the person doesn't feel as much on the spot if they just stay seated or stand, right? You know, where yeah. they're si 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 sitting. So, yeah. He's got it. We, yeah. So I, d I haven't figured out the mic yet. So you do have to walk up. You got person coming up. 
Um, my question is, I want you to think back to your first management interview. My first question is, did you, were you offered the position or not? In my first management interview, I think I, I think I was because that's a, that was actually my first telecommunications job. Now, you know, here's the, here's an interesting piece of that is that. When I interviewed for it and got the job, I really did not realize that it was a quote-unquote management position. I was uh, it was an engineering supervising uh, position in uh, in a telecommunications company up in Baltimore, Maryland, and um, I really I really did not I had no clue. It was my third job out of school. Uh, I have been out of school two years, and. Um, Really not, no clue as to, and it was also a union environment, which when you work in a union environment as a manager, it really throws a very different kind of flavor to to having to, how you work and how you are able to get productivity out of the jobs and the employees and so on and so forth. And, and so it was a great learning experience for me, but uh, it's funny that you asked that because my very first job was, you know, even for a management job. I really, when I when I jumped into it, I, I really did not, you know, up to that point, I, I had two engineering uh, jobs, you know, when I was doing engineering work and not supervision work. Okay. I was just wanting to know um, what you took away from your first uh, management position. Like, what did you get? What was the most that led to your most success? Would you feel was from that? I mean, I, you know, I had, I had, it was, it was a, um, it was an outside, uh, they call it outside plant people, you know, an outside people that work outside. It was kind of a, a rough working environment. It was a union environment. Um, um, and so people were very much in your face. You know, you gave people work and they took the work with them. And basically, so, so the, the way the job went is you, you showed up in the morning, you had a meeting, and basically you sent, you know, it's like, a, it's like, it's like if you're a, a repair person for your, your appliances at home, you know, that, so in the mor first thing in the morning, I'd have a meeting. Eight o'clock in the morning, we'd meet for 30 minutes. We talk about what it, that there were 15 people in the group. You talk about what everybody was going to do, and then you send them out, and they take their trucks and go out in the field. And then I would see them at five o'clock in the afternoon when they all came back, and they would all tell me what got done and what didn't get done. And you know, so it was very difficult because you you uh, you know you couldn't be watching over the people all the time. You, you you had no visibility to what they were doing or not doing. I had no idea as to whether they were actually working or they were sitting somewhere having a drink. And so um, it, really, it really taught me to be hands-on, you know, and to, and to figure out a way to keep track and understand what my people, or the people that work for me, are doing and if they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, 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 and you know, you learn, to, you learn to do that with finesse. Where you know you're not, you can't be upset every day because you find out that the guy that was supposed to be on the job was actually out messing around doing something else, and then you can't be screaming and yelling at, at everybody that doesn't do what they're supposed to do every day when they don't do it. So it forces you to to find a way to get things done and manage the people, you know, within the boundaries of you know sort of acceptable human behavior. But you know. It was that kind of a job because you, you you know when you you know if you have a job where you the, you see the people all the time and and it, and you're you're managing them you have eye contact you see what they're doing you see how productive they're being or not and you can walk over to them and say hey, listen you know you've been doing this for the last thirty minutes it should have taken you five that's that's much more easy to do than if they if you don't see them you know I mean and that happens that happened then because of that kind of job but it can also happen once you start to have People, you know, I have people that work for me that have thousands of people that work for them, so they don't have visibility to them all the time. Okay. All right, thank you. I hope that helped. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Rees, I just want to tag on basically on the management. I know a lot of the times that students suffer from time management. And can, you, can you do me a favor? Can you talk? Okay. Yeah, I can do Okay. All right. Um, a lot of us students suffer from time management. And I was just wondering, as a big person you are, running a big company, how do you fit your personal life and the, your life at work uh, all together and all, and all those things working into play? How, what are key points that you think are important to keep in mind in a daily, in day, into a day-to-day -day basis? 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I, you know, I, you probably, when I answer, you're going to say, you know, it sounds like I'm beating a dead horse, but I, I, I think it's very important that you know the kind of job that you want to do and the kind of job that you get into. Every job doesn't have the same kind of requirements. Uh, some jobs are much more demanding than others. And, and so I think, you know, when you, and, and a lot of times, no matter how good you interview, you won't know what the job is going to be like until you're in it and you're doing it. And I think that, that you, you, you know, you, sometimes there's not, a, there's not a magic formula or something that I can say to you that you can do that then it's going to make it all okay and it's going to provide you the right balance between work and family life or work and, and, and doing things that, that you actually need to do because you need to have a healthy mind or else if you're working all the time, sooner or later, you, you know, something goes wrong, you break down or you get unhappy and things don't go well. So I, I, you know, you, you have to find a way to you have to find a way that you feel like you have the right the right amount of balance. For the, you know, for the most part, what happens to most of us, especially if you get into high demanding jobs, is that we wind up. That's why you hear what you hear. You know, that's why you hear people people marriages get broken, people uh, aren't able to maintain a job, people get fired, or you know things go wrong because most jobs are very demanding and you do have to find a way to, to balance in a way that you can cope and that you can you know excel and you can do well and and at the same time you know the management and the, and the company is happy with you and at the same time you are you know you have a, a good life and you're able to do what you like to do and, and you're able to sustain whether it's a family or your own you know personal time um, but I, I think it's something that you, I mean, you know, a lot of times it's having the, having the presence of mind and the awareness to, to, to be asking yourself, you know, am I, you know if, you're, if you're working 12 hours a day and you've been doing it for two, three weeks running, you, you, you know, I mean, I hope you have the presence of mind to ask yourself, okay, is this healthy? You know, I'm not eating right. I'm not sleeping well. Um, and, and so ultimately, you know, you, you have to decide not to do the job or you can't do the job or you ask the boss for help. But, but something gives, sooner or later something gives. So I think that the most important thing is that you, you, have, a, you have good awareness of what you're doing and you, you, I mean, no one's responsible for you, your career, your job, your, your health, you are. And you have to make sure you take care of yourself. So what, you know, whatever you do, try to find a balance between work and, and, uh, and your lifestyle and, and make sure that that's what, that that's, you can live with it and you're happy with it. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, hello, Mr. Reza. Throughout your speech, you really concentrated on, on the t a topic of uh, global competition. So my question to you is, uh, does uh, being multilingual really provide an advantage for an engineer working for a big company such as Ericsson? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, most of our people uh, speak not just two languages, but three. I'm a, I'm a little bit of a, and Erickson, I'm a little bit of a, I speak too, Spanish and English. And um, there's many, many, many people that speak three. I mean, most Swedes speak two right off the bat because they, they go, when they go to school in Sweden, if you go to Stockholm, everybody speaks English. So, so almost every, you know, a million people in Stockholm, automatically everybody has two languages. Everybody speaks Swedish and everybody speaks English. So what happens is the people that go abroad, you know, they go, if they go to Latin America, then they wind up speaking a third language. If they go to Germany, they go to France, wherever they wind up going, they wind up picking up the third language. So, so being, being bilingual or multilingual definitely, definitely, um, I mean, it, it enhances your career path because it gives you choices that other people don't have. All right, thank you. Hi, Mr. Ruiz. My question is, in your early years, during your career, you compared yourself a lot to like your managers and you felt like you could do a better job than they did because it was, you work in such a competitive environment. I want to know, um, when's the period that you probably compared yourself to someone and fell short and how did you handle that situation? Uh, you know, I don't think that's ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'll be a little bit more modest. No, I, I, you know, of course, there are people that you that you work with, that you that you look up to, and uh, 
you know, I'm that day, and hopefully that will happen to you a lot because this is how you learn a lot. Um, when, when that happens, you, 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 again, you have to recognize it, and, and if you're able to recognize it, you should take advantage of it and, and learn from that part. So you, you, you know, you, you, and there are times when I'm doing that. There are times when I haven't done that. There are times when, when I've met up with someone that was, you know, as aggressive or motivated or some reasons I was, I was, they were pretty smart, and then I knocked my head, was, knocked my head, fell down. And that was not with Doug there. So, so, you know, you know when, when that happens, it doesn't lead to anything good. You just have to realize that that's what's happening and back off and, 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 and figure out another approach to, to get done what you need to get done and then learn from, from the people that, that, that work with you because most of the time that's how, you know, that's why I said that communication is so important when you communicate with those people, you learn a lot. Right. Thank you so much. Of course. Welcome. Hi, Mr. Ruiz. Thank you so much for coming, or, well, for speaking to us today. Um, so I was wondering. <laughs> um, so you're in a company, or you're in an industry that's very competitive. So I imagine that your employees have to be very, very creative and innovative to stay ahead of the game. How do you facilitate creativity and innovation? Um, and what are some of your core values that we can really take away from that, um, especially in today's, you know, very wireless world? Yeah, that's a that's a great question uh, for a company like Ericsson. I mean, we you know so so first of all, it starts with the the R and D budget. You know, we have to allocate a certain amount of money, and that's that, and that's a good indication. For example, if that's the area you want to work in, if you want to work in R and D, or you want to work in anything that entails development, you better pick a company that's going to have you know both the 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 willingness and the financial ability to dedicate a budget. To that area, you know, if the company should be spending a hundred million dollars in R&D and they're only spending ten, you're going to be frustrated. The projects are going to get cut. You're not going to get the funding you need. It's not going to work. You're not going to be happy. So, if that's the area you want to work in, try to find an industry that's growing, and try to find a company that likes and is motivated to put money, finance, budget into the R&D area. That's, a, that's how you get, you know, we, we work in a very, very innovative environment. And, and you know, and innovation doesn't just come from R&D, it comes from all over. So, you, you know, when a company, it, it's a cultural thing. The company has to have a culture where, you know, we realize that and then we enable our people, you know, it, it's, it's the environment that you provide. It's, it's the, you know, if you, look, if you look at our industry, we're not big on people having to sit at a desk for eight hours a day. You know, for what, what, minds, what matters to us is that people are thinking Ericsson 7x24. You know, if you walk around, you have, a, you have a mobile phone, you have an iPad, you're wirelessly connected. doesn't matter where you sit. I mean, there are, you know, there are jobs where you have to sit in an office and do the job, but we have lots of jobs where it doesn't really matter where, the, it doesn't really matter where, the, where, where you're sitting or where you're going or where you're standing or where you're walking. So... You know, again, you have to make sure that you you, you, you go to work in a company that is going to facilitate uh, an open environment where you are able to to do those things. You know, because it, it, it really it really when you when you get into a, a, an environment that requires um, innovation and like ours does. You know, if you if you look at everything that's happened on the handsets, for example, you know the device that you're carrying around and how it's incredible, it's an incredible incredible technology. Uh, it really requires people to be very, very innovative. And so the environment, the working environment, the, everything. I don't know if you've ever been, if you, if you ever have a chance to go to, uh, I hate to advertise another company, but a, a company like Google, the, the environment that they have on campus out in, in California, it's amazing. You know, it's, uh, so, you, so you, you know, it, it really starts there. So if, you, if, if that's important to you and that's what you want to see, you better see it in the culture of the company. If not, it's, it's going to struggle. You're going to struggle. OK. Thank you very much. Um, as those young people you know, go into in such a competitive workforce, and you're being put in like a pool of thousands of applicants at a time sometimes, and it's very important to diverse, diversify yourself, what do you think is the uh, most important way to set your side itself from the competition? Um, I mean, I, I think you know when you when you interview uh, for for jobs and and even when you once you're working, I mean, people look for that. And, and again, it's communication and 
I would say transparency. You know, I you you you, you want to work with people that make you feel good about working with them, and you want to make people feel good about working with you. And so if you, you know, so, and, and that's not easy. I mean, you have to be willing to open yourself up a little bit and let the person know what you're like and, and, and they let you know what they're like and have a, some kind of enough transparency that, that gives you that kind of feeling where you can show who you are and what you are and how you work and how you like to work and how you like to do things. Um, and then when you do that, then you're happy, you know, and, and, and again, what I, what I, what I submit to you is, is that if you interview and the interviewer doesn't give you that feeling, that's not the culture of the company, then you, you know, you're not, you know, you may not be happy. I mean, it, or it may not be conducive to, to, to what you're saying. It's not, it may not be conducive to you getting ahead because how are you going to get ahead if you can't show people what you're able to do? So you, you have to be able to work in an environment where you're, you're you know, people can see your ability and your capability and and see what you're capable of. You know, I mean, to get, for you to get a tryout, you know, people have to be willing to give you the tryout and, and see what you're able to do. If, if, if you're not afforded that chance and, and you can see that either in the interview or you can see that by the way that your manager works or your supervisor works or the people around you are working, then it's not going to happen. So believe it or not, after a while, it's something that you can fairly easily pick up um, and it's a great I mean it's a great mental position that you have already that you're aware of it and uh, because it, it, it will make you look for it and when you when you find it then then you'll find success thank you I think we've got one more hi thank you for your time today I just wanted to ask you what's the next big big thing in the industry or is that too proprietary no, no, I, I uh, you know, so, it, it, you know, and I never got to really say, I mean, Ericsson, you know, we, we used to have a partnership with Sony Ericsson, where we were also developing, you know, like consumer devices like handsets, telephone, uh, you know, wireless telephones. Uh, our business is more in what we call the infrastructure side, which is more of everything that's between the two phones, everything that makes the, the, the communications work. Um, if you look at these big networks that are out there, like AT&T and Verizon and Sprint and so on, um, the, the big what's called the macro networks, which is the networks that allow you to drive and roam and walk and, and you're all connected, those networks are, are getting better and better all the time. You know, you, you may still run into a, a spot where there's no coverage, but that, you know, that's become less and less, you know, it should be less and less time that, that you run into that. Um, where the challenges are still in our industry for the most part is in, you know, the amount of bandwidth and capacity that gets that gets to the device that enables you to do faster and faster, better quality video and data. Um, and so then it's it's both, you know, the, the, the more techn technological advances, but then also a lot of our challenges are what we call in building. Because, you know, I mean, the technology, you know, the, the airwaves, I mean, the radio waves have to penetrate buildings and and uh, and that create you know it, it has a certain amount of complexity to it and and it, it, in most countries around the world even in the US where you know wireless is pretty um, um, is already pretty widespread there's still a lot of challenges for what we call in building these big buildings and big venues you know, like big football state big, big sports stadiums and, and things like that so in building and what, what what's going to be called small cells, for for um, to be able to propagate the, the the wireless you know the radio communications into buildings and into areas where the big towers that are outside it just can't penetrate. That that's going to be a big big wave of technology that's now coming. Okay, thank you. Angel, again, thank you. I'm going to take your advice. I'm going to be more patient, but I'm going to go home and run so I can be healthy. Uh, enjoy your Friday. Enjoy your weekend. Again, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you.